Another great betrayal of Australian communities, but help is at hand. And will we follow an alcoholic dementia patient into nuclear war? Coming up on today's show. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 5th of August 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robbie Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the latest manoeuvres against Australia Post and Pelosi's Taiwan trip and the implications of that. Now, if you do like the show, make sure to hit the like button, make your comments, uh, subscribe so that you're notified of future shows and hit the notification bell uh, and additionally just share it as widely as you can to get the word out. Yep. Um, but straight on to our first topic, another great betrayal of Australian communities but help is at hand. Um, now uh, the negotiations are coming close to being concluded uh, about the new board and chairmanship of Australia Post and the word is out that uh, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese may, and the government may make the decision to appoint former ALP Minister for Communications Stephen Conroy to the board and perhaps even as the new chairman of Australia Post. Now, why is this a nightmare for LPOs, the licensed post office group, Robbie? Well, I suggest the, uh, the viewer goes and asks their LPO um, and get it from them firsthand. Uh, it's the LPOs that are saying this is an absolute nightmare. And it's, it's a betrayal on many fronts, but we're calling it a betrayal of Australian communities, Elisa, because your local post office, which most for most Australians, unless you're living in a sort of a, a, a built up, uh, densely populated big city area where you might be served by a corporate post office, in other words, a post office owned by Australia Post, most of the time your local post office is a small business and the people running it are hard-working Aussie small business people and they operate that post office under a licence to Australia Post, right? Now, um, those people deserve to make a living. You would think if you have a business where your income effectively comes from the Australian government, that should be a pretty good business, except it hasn't been. It's been one of the biggest um, uh, business and political jokes in Australia for decades. Um, it was a system where those, there's about 2,850 licensed post offices, they invest their own money in that business. And collectively, it's about $3 billion mm. that of small business private money is invested into providing our services. And think about that for a minute. I want, because I, I want the viewer to really empathize with what's happening here. Imagine a country where you don't have Australia Post. Because, you know, it's easy. this is an easy institution to take for granted. And as I've told you many times, and I told Angela Cramp from the LPO group, until the Christine Holgate thing came up, I took it completely for granted. Mm. I had no idea how it worked. This is how it worked. And these people, until Christine Holgate became CEO of Australia Post in 2017, these people were being exploited and they were hovering on the edge of bankruptcy. About 100 of them did go bankrupt. Mm. And the government, the management of Australia Post and the banks who are also exploiting them didn't care. And I want to play a couple of clips, which we didn't plan, but we'll, we'll stick them in. I want to play just a little short clip that we used in one of our videos last year um, of an episode of a short segment from A Current Affair a few years ago where they're interviewing one of these licensed post office um, owners, and he's explaining how the harder they work, the less money they make, and look how emotional he is. Why are they doing this to us? What has my wife and I done to deserve this treatment? I'm sorry. It's absolutely heartbreaking. <laughs> no one seems to care. No one. They just don't care what they're doing to us. This suburban Australia post office has become a living hell for David McIntyre and his wife, Jan. It can be demoralising and depressing, 
And we've had to live with it every day for the last 10 years. They're not struggling due to lack of business. In fact, it's booming thanks to online shopping. And that's the very reason why the couple, along with many other hardworking Australia Post licensees, are so devastated. The busier you are, the less you're earning. That's and the reality that is, here. That is the reality. Mum and dad investors put their life savings into a government run business and this is what we've copped. They should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> I can't do this. I'm sorry. Now, Elisa, that man was expressing, I don't. I actually don't know that particular gentleman. Um, I know a lot of other licensed post office, but not that guy. But what he was expressing is what they've all told me. And until before Christine Holgate took over, they were being run by a CEO from 2009 to 2017 named Ahmed Fahor. Mm -hmm. And Ahmed Fahor was deliberately running Australia Post into the ground. He was setting it up for privatisation. He was asset stripping the business. Under him, they started making losses for the first time in their history. Um, and the whole purpose was to privatise it, right? Stephen Conroy appointed him. Mm. Stephen Conroy was the communications minister who went out and found this ex-Boston Consulting Group consultant and ex-NAB banker to put him in charge of Australia Post, right? And what he did was set this organisation up for privatisation. Stephen Conroy was therefore the person who put Australia Post on the path to privatisation. There was an expenses scandal about how much he was paid because he was really well paid, um, Ahmed Fahor, and um, he was replaced by Christine Holgate. And what did Christine Holgate do? She came in and took a completely different approach. She opposed privatisation. She saw that the banks were exploiting the LPOs because the... the, the um, that the, the banking services that you can have at a licensed post office, um, they were underpaying for, right? So that, you know, for, for instance, when, when the banks would pull out of a community, like they're doing now, you're supposed to be able to go to the bank, the post office and do your banking, right? Mm. And they, were, they weren't paying for that properly. <laughs> and the LPOs were losing money. She, she fixed that and she made the banks pay. And in, in doing so, she made enemies, right? That led to a big inquiry. Um, that we were involved in. Remember, we were the people who were, took the LPO's reports of Christine Holgate seriously. They said that she was the greatest CEO they've ever had, Australia Post has ever had, and that led to the inquiry. And one of the things that came up with that inquiry, Elisa, was just how politically stacked the Australia Post board was. Now, last month, the Grattan Institute did a report on sort of the, the um, how would you say, like the low-level corruption in Australia in the form of the number of political appointees, politically connected appointees to the boards of, ver st at state and federal level, mm. government all sorts of government enterprises. So jobs for mates of jobs the for politicians. Mates. And it's things like boards of government business enterprises, it's things like um, even you know museum boards and whatever, right? 22% of um, government business enterprises have boards where the appointees are politically connected to the governments who appointed them. 22%, 22% of the employees, sorry, on all the government and business enterprises in Australia, 22% of the board directorships are people who are politically connected to the governments who appointed and them. And not just members of the party, but ex-MPs, prominent exactly, people. Exactly, exactly. The worst case in the whole report was Australia Post. <laughs> because in the case of Australia Post, it's half. And half of them are Liberals. They're ex-MPs, like you said, etc. Chief of Staff, all sorts. Half of the board of Australia Post right now are connected to the Liberal Party. But guess what? That's only because the Liberal Party had been in government for nine years. Mm. Before that, they were Labor Party, right? And, and what happens is these two major parties divide these board appointees ships up as spoils of war. When they're in government, it's their turn to reward their friends. So this became an issue at the Australia Post inquiry. And that inquiry said... It found, it is the committee's strong view that more care and attention must be given to the appointment of directors to government business enterprise boards, including Australia Post, to ensure the appropriate levels of diversity, a range of experience and skills, and an absence of political loyalties. Mm -hmm. Then it recommended the government, quote, restore an appropriate level of independence to the board and restructure the board to include nominees of the House of Reps, the Senate, the employees and unions and the licensees, i.e. the post offices, the licensed post offices. 
So don't have boards that are politically stacked with ex-politicians. Put, some, you know, the, the government should make the decisions, but the House of Reps should nominate people, the Senate should nominate people, the unions who represent the workforce, let them nominate a representative on the board of Australia Post, and the licensees, the most invested stakeholders, the people who put $3 billion of their money into, we're, all, we're stakeholders, we're the customers. The unions are stakeholders, they're the workers. But they can leave that, they, don't, they, don't, they haven't invested their money, they rely on it for an income. And if they don't like it, they can leave and go somewhere else. Um, the people running the place have invested nothing. The board have invested nothing. The management have invested nothing. Right? Yet they're making these decisions that are costing people their livelihoods. So surely the licensed post officers should get a seat on the board. Can we all agree with that? So instead, what has happened? The Labor Party, Elisa, signed off on... They supported these recommendations yeah. last year. Albanese was the leader of the Labor Party. His party supported these recommendations. And what we're hearing now is that he is preparing to throw this whole thing out so he can appoint a man who is essentially returned to the scene of the crime, Stephen Conroy, who helped set up this business for failure so it could be privatised because the first thing the licensed post officers told me when I first talked to them, they said, privatisation is not just a Liberal plot. The Labor Party were doing it as well. And Albanese is throwing out, a rip if, if the processes of Parliament mean anything, his party, he endorsed this report, mm. and instead of putting an LPO on the board, he's putting Stephen Conroy on the board mm. and maybe the chairman. And people, you've got this... This is not, don't think about when you're hearing me carry on like this, oh, is Robert Barwick persuasive? Think about your local small business in your community who serves you, who was going, who's still, you're lucky they're still there because they were going bankrupt so hard before 2017. And now they're living in fear of their financial viability again. Get mad like me and do something about it, right? We cannot, you know, what happens is, Elisa, the public expect these kinds of stories. Mm. People who tune into this show expect these kinds of stories. And because we expect them, we get mad or you think, yeah, those bastards, and then shrug and that's move on. That's what always happens. Yeah. yeah, You can't do anything about it. <laughs> and that's, that's what's got to stop. We've got to do something about it because yeah. if we put enough pressure on, we will be able to. And just to say, um, you know, you were in Canberra this week uh, last week with the head of the licensed post office yep. group, Angela Cram, and she's someone that has done something about it. She started that network of local licensed post offices to do something about it and now is fighting with us as many of the post offices to get a postal bank which will ensure the survival of the local post offices. And she, and she did that, Elisa, when Stephen Conroy was the minister. Mm -hmm. She and other LPOs started going to Parliament because their minister, the man who should have been making sure that Australia Post was run properly and every part of the business was looked after, couldn't give a stuff. Yeah. And so she organised a group to form the Licensed Post Office Group. And mind you, Stephen Conroy was one of the uh, very early people who attacked Christine Holgate over oh. the whole... Cartier Watches scandal, which was just the contrived scandal to get her out of the job because she was blocking the privatisation of Australia Post by making it profitable again. Furthermore, she wanted to, she had talked about making Australia Post into a postal, postal bank, bank on the model of various other successful nations, uh, models around the world of nations that have postal banking, which she has uh, researched by going and visiting those countries. Her performance as CEO of Australia Post proved, it proved one or two things. Either, either Conroy was one of the most incompetent people in the history of government in Australia because he was letting it be turned into a basket case under his watch and his appointee, Ahmed Fahor's watch, right? He was, he was, there, until, he was there from 2009 to 2013 and then... Um, the Liberals were there from 2013 to 2017 under Ahmed Fahor. So he had half of Ahmed Fahor. He picked Ahmed Fahor. So he's either incompetent or what a treacherous bastard he actually is mm. because this was a push to privatise. And she showed... And, and see, what when the, both major parties are neoliberal and they go, oh, like privatisation's inevitability. See, government can't run anything. She showed that you could run Australia Post in a way that increased its revenue to, to support its services. Yep. And the big one was... As you said, postal services. And 
if you want an example banking of Banking services. Sorry, banking. Combining postal and banking services. If you want an example of his hypocrisy, you're right. He, he sat there on Sky News last year and called her ex her buying, spending $20,000 on Cartier watches to reward the executives who landed the deal to make the banks pay more, which made Australia Post profitable again and made the LPOs viable. He called that $20,000 extravagant spending. Yet when he was the minister, his pick, Ahmed Fahor, 2012... Now, bear in mind, Australia Post is a virtual monopoly. Not exactly, not totally, but mostly a monopoly. Ahmed Fahor took 70 customers, big business customers, who, in order to wine and dine them, mm. but you don't need to, they've got nowhere else to go, mm. took 70 to the London Olympics, all expenses paid, best hotels, price tag $2.89 million, mm. And that happened under Stephen Conroy's mm, watch. 20,000, nearly 3 million. million. That's what was happening at Australia Post under him. And he had the gall to attack Christine Holgate and for And Christine $20, Holgate for her 20,000 secured delivered. payments from the banks who were shutting down their branches in all the regional communities as well as a lot of city areas so that people in those communities can still do banking. Um, you know, a critical function. So Angela Cramp of the licensed post office, when she heard about this news this week or in the recent period about um, looking almost certain that Conroy will be brought in to yeah. one of these positions on the Australia Post board, this is what she tweeted, uh, that it would be a nightmare, he's the ultimate party hack and it will bleed the LPO network dry again. In another tweet she said, what sort of karma would that be for serving our communities with dedication and goodwill while we tried to recover from the damage he did to our industry only to see him step back in and start all over again? Now, Alyssa, um, we're going to put a link below, which is the link when Anthony Albanese became Prime Minister, you can't call up his office as easily and have a crack at him. So anyway, there's a Prime Minister website and there's a communications portal on there. Right, and if you click on the link, it'll take you straight there. And you can type a message to him um, from yourself, and we need you to do that. Flood his damn portal today, mm. all weekend, next week, to say, don't you dare appoint this guy to the Australia Post board. You stand by your the report that you endorsed last year to restructure that board properly, because this is our asset. We're the Australian people. We own this damn thing. We're sick of you guys sabotaging our service. And, and for those of you who attempted to make a comment below, make any comments you like. But the ones who are going to complain about the poor delivery standards of Australia Post now, this is all part of that picture. Christine couldn't turn everything around. She's only there for three years. She was trying to turn. She had a plan to turn it all around. What she started to do was brilliant, undeniably brilliant, right? And, and these were the people who did that. And this is why... Um, uh, if Conroy gets back in there, he'll be returned to the scene of the crime. Mm. Now, why do we say help is at hand, though? Because I was in Canberra this week with Angela, as you said. Um, we got some good press coverage from mm. it on uh, 3AW and 6PR in Perth. And they're the biggest radio stations in uh, either of those cities. And they're talk back, so you get you know a, a discussion engagement. going yep. on, engagement, people ringing in about it. They were all really interested in the fact that we were there talking about a postal bank. And they got the difference between bank at post, which serves the other banks, and an actual bank. So instead of banking at the post office, you'll bank with the post office because it's a bank that will be a government bank and force the private banks to compete. Really, really crucial. And I was really struck by that interest that they had. Um, we have, we have uh, tied down the fact that Bob Catter MP is... Um, doing everything he has to do right now to prepare to introduce a bill very soon into Parliament. And so we'll, we'll keep people reporting on how that goes. Um, I want to play another clip that I haven't cleared with you. <laughs> um, but you did see it. Now, I, want to, I just want to play quickly the clip from Parliament yesterday where in the 92nd member statements, Rob Mitchell, the, member, the Labor member for McEwen, got up and said this. I give the call to the member for McEwen. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Once again, we've seen the big banks treat regional communities with absolute contempt. The Commonwealth Bank is closing their branch in Woodend, plus the ATM, but what they did is not have the decency to actually 
talk to the community and find out what our needs are. Older people, small businesses that need um, to you know, change, get change and access that and pay bills can't do this in regional communities because of what's been happening in the banking sector. Now, the Commonwealth Bank made $8 billion profit last year. You'd think if you could do that, you could keep some bank branches open in communities where there is no public transport and you're expecting disabled people, elderly people and businesses to travel 20, 30 kilometres to get to the nearest branch. It's absolutely appalling that they've done this with no consultation and no input from anyone in the community. Now, of course, the bank comes out and says, oh, it's OK, you can go to the post office and do all your bill paying there. Well, already our postal staff are under stress because of the workload that they're getting. You know, I mean, the, the previous government tried to put Centrelink in there as well to make even their job even harder. But the fact of the matter is not everyone is capable to use electronic banking. And the idea to say that the bank says, well, we've had a decrease in foot traffic over the last two years. Well, yeah, you have. Pandemics has caused that. Lockdowns have caused that. There is no reason to shut this branch. There is no reason that the the Commonwealth Bank can't pause this closure, speak to the community and come to a suitable arrangement that suits everyone. So I've called on the Commonwealth Bank to pause this immediately and reverse these decisions to cut branches in regional towns. Now, Lisa, that story has been repeated all around Australia, right? It's happened. He's, he's reacting to the bank shutting down his, his town, Woodend. Um, notice he says, what does the bank say? Oh, you can bank at the post office. Well, not... Don't, don't assume that if, if Stephen Conroy gets back mm -hmm. on the board. But nevertheless, what does that mean you can bank at the post? Of course you can, and we have to make sure that you can always do that. But if it becomes a bank, then the bank, Commonwealth Bank won't be game to shut down in that town because it'll lose all its customers to the bank to the to the post office. Right? Because at the moment it's saying you can bank at the post office, they're just exploiting the taxpayer. They're exploiting the LPO again, right? Make it its own bank and watch the dynamic change in Australia. But that's being repeated all around the place. Um, while I was up there, what, did, what was the latest um, Westpac announcement? Another 200 branches. Um, 100. 100 branches that they're shutting down, right? This is happening at a rapid, rapid rate right around Australia. And that's what's feeding into our campaign. Mm. Our postal bank, we've got, the, we've got the legislation, we've got the politicians that are prepared to introduce it. Um, we've got politicians like that complaining about the problem. We've documented how it will solve these problems. And just on that, we won't play this clip um, because I don't want to stress, stretch your uh, patience. <laughs> um, but because most of you are going to be watching on YouTube, have a look at our very, very latest yeah. video that's there, just the previous video before this one on YouTube. It's a four minute video about how the Postal Bank will solve this problem of regional branch closures. It's just a video about that. The problem with regional bank branch closures and what the Postal Bank can do, and we rely on the research of this, the great journalist um, Dale Webster, who's documented all this. This solves the problem, right? This is the help that's at hand. Mm. This is something that previous Labor governments, when they actually stood for something, gave us as a legacy in Australia because they set up the first postal bank here. It was called the Commonwealth Bank. And they fought for it for 84 years to make sure it was there to serve the people of Australia until they sold out. Mm. The Labor Party sold out and started privatising it, right? And now we're in a mess. We're in a financial mess. We're in a services mess. What, is, what does Anthony Albanese stand for? Mm. So you, the viewer, the Australian citizen, you get involved in our campaign, right? actually foresee the future where you, if you support this, don't just be passive, be active. Make these, set, um, communicate to Albo that he must not at all, at any, uh, at all costs appoint Conroy to the board and contact your local member of parliament and senators to say you must support Bob Catter's bill for a postal mm. bank. And the unions, I might add, have been a big part in pushing for a postal bank, yes. independently of anything we've done for a few years now. There's big businesses that are very supportive of this. The breadth of support, even from members of parliament, from every party, big and small, is quite um, stunning, actually. So, yeah, make a point of talking to your MP about that, that he support this bill when it comes up. Um, anything else on Canberra before we move on? Uh, no, except I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, no, and soon. So the fight continues. Now, on to our next topic. Will we follow an alcoholic dementia patient into nuclear war? <laughs> now and, you'll... and it's as much a laughing matter as Dr Strangelove, Elisa, mm. which means... 
It ain't. No, it actually isn't. But you'll hear um, in a moment where that where we got that term alcoholic dementia patient from. Um, but on the serious side, look, this week, and people may have heard it on the news, you, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, literally said these words, today humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. This was at the 10th review conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. He talked about the fact that we've forgotten in our memories, we've wiped out what happened in Hiroshima sure. and Nagasaki. Yep. Um, and that the danger um, is very, very close. It could take one tiny misstep. And we've just had an example of that in living colour with um, the Speaker of the United States Congress, Nancy Pelosi, and a congressional delegation uh, having been in Taiwan. This is the highest ranking American official to set foot there in a quarter of a century and violates the one China principle and stipulations between the US uh, and, and China of three joint communiques. It sends a clear signal from the USA to Taiwan, um, to Taiwan independence movements, I should say, that the US will support that move for independence. And it comes in the context of uh, countless comparisons of Taiwan to Ukraine, of course, with the ongoing Russia intervention there. Uh, and with the approval of new US arms sales that have just been made to Taiwan and additionally a new bill in the US Congress that's just been tabled that would shift the sale of arms from merely defensive weapons to go beyond that and would also establish higher level diplomacy with Taiwan that has existed to date. Now, Elisa, all the news reporting we're getting this week since Pelosi was there and left filtered to the Australian audience is about how provocative China is being, how China mm. is escalating, right? Because China said, if you come, there will be a response, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, there's a response, but, but they report the response as if there's no justification, right? Um, well, uh, for 30 years, we're going to play some clips on this, all right, so I don't know, I'll, I'll let some of these mm. American military experts speak for themselves, because don't take our word for it. But for 30 years, uh, Russia warned the West, if you keep doing that, if you keep coming closer to that... Our borders. We're going to react at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And one day they did. And China has said it for 50 yeah. years. Yes. And look, they've just been restating consistently um, that they will act resolutely to safeguard their sovereignty. And this is a part of China. How would we react? The, the, of what you just went through then, though, so in one sense, the, the, the most dangerous part is, is the part where um, the Chinese are saying, look, this sends a clear signal from the United States to the Taiwan independence movement. Mm -hmm. Because last year, former Paul, Prime Minister Paul Keating went to the National Press Club because he is someone that is actually, I have lots of arguments with, about Keating on different things, but on foreign affairs, he's quite credible. And he warned about Ukraine early back in the 90s, and he warned about, he's been warning about this China thing for a long time. And he said then, he, re, he reminded those young, idiotic journalists at the press club, frankly, most of them would just have no sense of history whatsoever. He reminded them how the Chinese have always said, Taiwan can do what it likes, except not declare independence. Hmm. And if we if the Americans are encouraging them, their independence movements. Right? Yeah, and they had meeting. Pelosi had meetings with these people in yeah. these independence movements. Um, but and actually, just to add to that, because uh, Paul Keating made a statement this week where he said um, he. He said, you know, we really have to um, be careful that this situation's not misjudged or mishandled because the outcome would be catastrophic. And he said, a peaceful resolution requires a contribution from us, calm, clear and sensitive to the messages being sent, i.e. from China. Yeah. Um, now, is this calm and clear response? Well, there are three US Navy aircraft carriers operating in striking distance of Taiwan right now. The USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier and strike group is in the Philippine Sea. The USS Tripoli is carrying 12, 20 stealth fighters just south of Okinawa. The USS America, capable of carrying F-35Bs is in the East China Sea. Uh, on July 19th, the USS Benfold, a guided missile destroyer, just passed through the Taiwan Strait. The UK Navy, which announced 
A year ago, it would permanently station two warships in Asian waters. Recently sent the HMS Tamar to Darwin as part of this five-year presence that they are making to stake their claim in the quote-unquote Indo-Pacific region. Um, now, so that's what we're doing. What China has done in re reaction to Pelosi's visit is conducting air and naval exercises around Taiwan, including, as you're hearing in the media now, live fire drills. This is the first time since 1996. It has also just implemented trade sanctions against Taiwan, um, stopping imports of things like frozen fish and white sand that's critical for production of microchips. And in these cases, this will have a big impact because 90 to 100 per cent of Taiwan's exports go to China of these items. Um, now, Xi Jinping, the president of China, did have a discussion prior to this latest visit on the 28th of July with Biden. Uh, and he did make it very explicit. He said, those who play with fire will perish by it. He restated that China will defend the territory of Taiwan. Biden, on the other hand, restated the one China policy. But um, with this visit by Pelosi, it undermines, you know. Well, the, the, the Chinese do not believe for one minute that despite Biden advising her not to go, despite the Pentagon advising her not to go, do not believe for one minute she's not serving US foreign policy. Yeah. Right? They hold the government, the president, the White House responsible for this visit. And um, Biden can pretend, you know, it's like Pelosi said, oh, she she doesn't have to run it by him because they're a co-equal, the, 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 um, the branches of... The Congress is a co-equal branch of government. Well, get real. China's not interested in the niceties of the American Constitution. Mm. They're interested in, we had an agreement 50 years ago. They said that Ken, Henry Kissinger called up Zhao Enlai and said, we want to talk. America initiated it. And Zhao Enlai said, okay, on one condition. You state right here, right now, that there is one China and Taiwan is a province of China. And Kissinger said, done. Mm. And then the next year we did it. We stated exactly the same thing because... Everyone wanted to do business with China. The massive market of China, all the benefits of, of engaging with China finally. We all had to agree to one condition and we happily did it. Right? And China made that the condition all along. And you and I published a, a, um, a, a transcript last year, remember, of, of two very wise Singaporean diplomats talking about this exact thing. Kishore Mababani and um, uh, George Gao, the former foreign minister. And they both said to use Taiwan, play Taiwan as if it's a card in the relationship that America can play. I'm going to play the Taiwan card. Totally misreads it. It's mm -hmm. not a card. It's the bedrock. It's the bedrock of the relationship. China does not have a relationship with you on any other basis. And that's why America is playing with fire. So I've said that. Listen to some yeah, real experts, what uh, they say. We're going to play a clip from Scott Ritter, the former Marine Intelligence Officer and Weapons Inspector. This is an interview he just did with journalist David Spurrier, and he, he says in this interview that America's one China commitment died when Pelosi made this trip. So we'll just, there's a couple of different... And he, and he expresses how absolutely dangerous that is. Mm, so there's a couple of different clips here. We'll just put them together and come back to you. The other aspect of that is, of course, dysfunctional American policy. <laughs> we don't know what the hell we're doing. We don't have a policy. Right. And one of the reasons why we don't have a policy is that we don't respect China. You know, sort of like we didn't respect Russia. Yeah. Remember in the lead up to Ukraine, Russia will never invade. They don't have the economy to invade. They don't have the military to invade. They're bluffing. They're bluffing. They're bluffing. Putin don't bluff. They invaded. They're winning. He lost across the board. Because we're getting ready to be humiliated in a way we haven't been humiliated ever. And this is going to be worse than Pearl Harbor if we choose to escalate. There's going to be a political Pearl Harbor because China's taking Taiwan. Get used to it. It's going to happen. We crossed a red line and we can't say they didn't warn us. They said, we don't want to do this. Please don't make us do this. And yet we sent Nancy Pelosi, even though the president said it's stupid, the Pentagon said it's stupid, the State Department said it's stupid. We let an 82-year-old alcoholic get on an airplane, take the United States to war. That's 
called dysfunctional policy. And if every American listening to this, every global citizen, is it furious? Yeah. Nothing will infer you. This is the dumbest thing we have done in a long, long, long time. And there will be ramifications. Any idiot that thinks, China would never do this because they fear economic sanctions. What? Yeah. China will shut us down long before we shut them down. Right. Yeah. Will there be will there be economic repercussions for China? Sure, just like there were for Russia. Last time I checked, Russia's running a surplus. We're in a recession. Goodbye, Taiwan. Enjoy what little you have left of your pathetic little existence. It's on you. You could have said no. You could have turned the plane around. You could have done something. Instead, you're letting Nancy Pelosi land on your soil, and she's going to meet not only with your parliament. Hey, why? What? Legislature meeting with legislature as equals. That's called independent minded. She's going to meet with the leader of the political party that's advocating independence from China. I mean, literally load the damn bullet into the gun before giving it to the Chinese so they can put it in your head and pull the trigger. This is stupidity personified. Yeah. And it's going to end with dead Americans. So, yeah. There's the, there's the alcoholic dementia patient. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've made the same mistakes we made with Russia. Um, we've crossed the red line with China. Uh, again, if we sanction China as we did Russia, it ain't going to make an iota of difference. Um, these are the things he's saying. We're loading the gun and telling China to pull the trigger. This is just the height of insanity. And we now want to run another clip. Um, Can I say something about Scott Ritter? So Scott Ritter is, um, an, ex, is an American veteran, military veteran. But, but if you don't know, he's the, in the lead up to the Iraq war, there was one American who, he did what Andrew Wilkie did in Australia, basically say, he was a weapons inspector in Iraq. He said there is no weapons of mass destruction. That man is credible. He gets smeared now as a, as a, um, you know, a Russian stooge and whatever. No, no, only because he took on the American war machine and tried to stop a war. Right? He is he's honest and he's credible. And and you see how fired up he gets there. Um, the next guy is just as credible. Douglas yeah. McGregor is one of the most brilliant American um, military commanders in our in our lifetime. Um, he fought in the first. Gulf War, um, when Saddam invaded Kuwait as a tank commander, and he cleaned house like he was undeniably brilliant. He was uh, he was some kind of um, trainer of of um, American military expertise as well because he was so good. Um, he never rose above colonel because, like other people, um, if you don't kiss ass, you don't rise higher, and he never kissed ass, mm -hmm. right? And he's been a consistent voice. On the, on the follies of American foreign policy for a long time. Donald Trump should have employed him as his defence secretary. Mm -hmm. was too gutless too. When Donald Trump lost the election in 2020 and he was in that lame duck period, he then employed Douglas McGregor to try and organise getting out of Syria and Afghanistan. And McGregor had no real time to, to actually act on that, but the Afghanistan thing eventually happened. Um, he is, it, it's, it's, it's remarkable he even gets on uh, television, mm. but he does, and listen to what he says about this. Uh, the, we don't have anyone that qualifies as a statesman. Statesmanship involves advancing American interests at the least cost to the American people. There, none of that is in play here. We're dealing with a group of posers, people who are posturing. Posturing is not statesmanship. And the American people need to understand something that no one has bothered to tell them, that during World War II, Taiwan was the unsinkable aircraft carrier of the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces. All the major invasions of China were launched from Taiwan. Beijing will not allow Taiwan to become a garrison state for American armed forces or Japanese armed forces or any foreign power. And if they think that we are going to ally ourselves with Taiwan, if they think we are going to intervene to defend that island in the event of a dispute, then we will be at war with China for the reasons that I just outlined. And we are not prepared for that. We are grossly overstretched. We don't have the logistical infrastructure. And frankly, there's an old adage that everyone should remember, a ship's a fool to fight a fort. You have to fight China from the sea. We can't win that. 
China can absorb everything we throw at it. And the Chinese are happy to sit there, let us travel thousands of miles to reach them, and then sink us. This, is, I, I, I don't know why every show on TV is not covering this right now. This seems like one of the craziest things that's happened in my lifetime. Do you have any speculation and guess as to why the Biden administration would want this? Well, the Biden administration and its predecessors, frankly, treated everything that the Russian government said for the last 15 years about Ukraine with complete contempt. They're repeating that process. We see how well that's worked out in Ukraine. The Russians yeah. were always serious. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost in this war in Ukraine that we should have acted quickly to stop. Now we're provoking the Chinese over an, over an issue that is at least as strategically important to them. That's uh, beyond belief. I, I have to say one other thing, Elisa, based on that clip. Because um, you heard people heard McGregor speaks for himself. We're going to take issue with Tucker Carlson. Because Tucker Carlson you know, says, you know, how's it come to this? You, Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is one of these schizophrenic Americans who says, oh, I learned from the Gulf War. I learned from the, from the Iraq War how we, we lie to start wars, right? And so when he's talking about Russia and Ukraine, some of the best things on American television are on Tucker Carlson's show. He, t he presents the truth. But then he makes this schizophrenic exception. They, they tell us lies about Russia and Ukraine and Putin, but everything they tell us about Xi and China is true. He's done more to stir up anti-China hatred in America than probably any other person on American television, that guy. Mm. And he's wondering how it came to this. Mm -hmm. The reason the Pentagon, the reason the, the assholes in the White House who want to start a war and all the neocon networks, Tucker, get to do it because it's a popular idea to Americans because you've popularised it. And there's very few people... I mean, we're an exception and are prepared to take on these prejudices against China because we, we will not stand by the McCarthyism that's just a, that just paves the way to war. But anyway, good on him for having... I hope he learned something from that interview at least mm. and I hope everyone learns from that interview. And just one other important thing we wanted to add. You can read an article uh, in this week's Australian Alert Service for the detail on this, but it's you know another side to this whole war drive, yep. war mongering that's been going on, and that is the situation vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine right now. I mean, there's a lot more that could be said about that, obviously, but we just wanted to mention uh, this. People may have heard about this blacklist that Ukraine has put out. This was issued by the Centre for Countering Disinformation under the title of Speakers Who Spread Narratives Consonant with Russian <laughs> Propaganda. Uh, and at a Consonant means in harmony, right? Yeah. But what that means is people who say, hang on, when Russia makes a certain claim, it's, it's not automatically wrong, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, you're not on it yet. I'm not on it yet. We <laughs> might be shortly. Don't say yet. Oh, <laughs> but it's a many friend of, of ours is. Many of, our, of ours many of our collaborators in the United States uh, with the International Schiller Institute, uh, Helga Zeppelarouche, and many of the collaborators that they work with, yeah, like um, former CIA um, veteran Ray McGovern, who works with the Veteran in Intelligence Professionals for Sanity now, former State Senator Richard Black, many people who have been putting out really vital information about what's happening in the world. Um, but at a US State Department sponsored conference, the acting director of this Ukrainian Centre for Countering Disinformation called the people on this list information terrorists who will have to answer to the law as war criminals. And Scott Ritter has said that Ukraine has a history of converting blacklists of this nature into kill lists. Yeah. Uh, and our friend, um, former New Zealand government minister, Matt Robson, his name was on that list. You can see uh, interviews Robbie's done with him uh, if you scroll through our YouTube channel. Um, on these topics and he responded to this with a statement which we published in the alert service saying he's been placed on this blacklist. He said, I'm actually quite flattered to be in the company of the eminent people on this list. 
um, with a widely varying opinions on the nature of the war in Ukraine. He went on to cite the freedom of expression guaranteed under the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and indeed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he said, I am writing to the Prime Minister of New Zealand to ask her to take up with the government of the Ukraine this breach of my right under both New Zealand and international law to freely express my opinions and my being on a list that endangers my safety. Um, so you can read, as I said, more in the alert. This ov a whole operation overlaps very significantly with the counter disinformation networks that we've covered in the alert service before of the 77th Brigade run out of the British government, the British Army. And also to note, um, that the President of Ukraine, Zelensky, has also, as we've also noted in the alert service recently, banned opposition political parties, a total of 16 of them. He now has the power to cancel Ukrainian people's citizenship by decree and is currently utilising butterfly or petal mines against citizens of the Donetsk region. These are anti-personnel mines. They don't have any military impact. It's just to... Kill and maim people. Kill and maim, and in that region, it's mainly the citizens there that are being affected by this. They can't be demined or deactivated very easily at all. So this is something that, again, the breaches of world international yep. standards, law, human rights are enormous here. Elisa, um, when you see a, a, a hit list like this, a blacklist like this, and that the fact that it could become a kill list, this is deadly serious, right? And the reason, the overarching reason it's deadly serious because we're talking about war. War is hell, war is death, and that's why you've got to fight with all your being to avert a war. We failed vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Ukraine and Russia, right? Um, because we refused to take the other side seriously, and um, that's a long way from us. We must not fail vis-a-vis -vis China and Taiwan because we will be in the firing line. Take it very, very seriously. And if you think America will protect us, there's nothing in the ANZUS Treaty that obliges America to protect Australia. It's just a, it's just a treaty to, to consult. That's why the Citizens Party has put our reputation on the line for years now to go up against the 80% of Australian people who think China is the great big threat in the world, which it is not. And um, we will not stop contradicting that narrative because you're, by even thinking that, by even the, every time you hear an anti-China claim, you think, yeah, bloody Chinese, you are talking yourself into a war of annihilation of you and your loved ones and our whole nation because we are not going to win it. Mm. Yep. Right? We are not. Take it seriously. We have to stop it. Right, that said, contact us for more information, get involved, subscribe to the publication, support us in whatever way you can and keep on the case of your local MP and Mr Albanese. That's the show for this week. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for tuning in. Join us again next week.